Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 221 of the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers here, as always, with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. Are you ready for back to school? No. (laughs) We have this, there's all, this happens every year. If you guys have been listening for a while, my kids in Southern California go back in mid-August. Megan's in Michigan do not go back until after Labor Day. So it, it doesn't, it's only maybe a three, three and a half week difference, but it feels so different this time of year because one of us oh, is yeah. like in the mode <laughs> and the other is like, la, 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 don't talk to well, me. Well, and for me, I don't even really get into summer. Like I always find that the front two months, the first two months of my summer are always very loaded. Um, and then August is like our play month. Mm-hmm. It's the month I tend not to schedule a lot of stuff. So I'm like, not only am I not in school mode, but I'm in like height of summer right, right now. Like this is it. Well, this is it. Yeah. as is our tradition, I sort of force you to talk about back to school topics this time of year on the podcast because, oh, that's all right. <laughs> and you are Cause very, you, cause you want to, and it's all about what Sarah wants. <laughs> <laughs> cause we have many, many listeners with kids starting school. So one yeah. thing we thought would be fun this year, I have a child entering middle school for the first time. My oldest is going into middle school and many of you out there have kids, um, kind of at the early elementary school ages. So we thought, um, that if Megan could give a little advice about starting middle school, middle school and high school, some nuggets of wisdom, some things that you've learned along the way. And then I have some things to share that I've learned about for families starting elementary school. So we're going to kind of split it up. I'll, I'll give some nuggets of wisdom in the first half, and then you'll, you'll tell me what to think about and all of your wise words <laughs> about starting middle school. I can't believe Get ready. middle school. <laughs> um, yeah. So sit back guys. And whether you have little kids who are just starting preschool all the way up through high school, we have some, I don't know. Should we call them hard won lessons or just? I think, it, I mean, they might not even be that hard won. Yeah. I think maybe we could de, we could de, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Anxiety eyes. That yes. is not a word, but take some of that anxiety out because I think what, uh, what we realize, what I have realized, look with kids starting middle school is it's, it is all going to be okay. Even when it's totally new right. and on you and not what you're used to and a little scary. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. As usual, we aim to, um, just ratchet down the panic a little bit and use our experiences to help you guys realize it's, it's all going to be okay. And also it doesn't all have to happen and be done by the first day. So we'll kind of give that, give that context a little bit. All right, we're going to take a break and then we will get into it. So Sarah, we have both dealt with challenges in our lives as moms, but we're just two people. So there are a lot of big life changes and things we just haven't gone through. For example, we know we have moms listening to us who've dealt with miscarriage, loss, and babies who've had an extended hospital stay. And I know it's so valuable when you're dealing with a stressful or sad situation to hear stories from other moms who've gone through similar situations and came out the other side. Yeah, we know that hearing stories that sound a little like yours can make you feel so much less alone and also give you hope that things are going to keep getting better. So that's why we've loved partnering with Unspoken Stories. It's a podcast from the March of Dimes that features real stories from courageous parents who open up and share about the realities of parenting in the face of some really hard circumstances. I just have to say that I was impressed by how uplifting these stories are. There's some tough topics. The moms are really honest about the pain and struggle they're going through, but they're also really strong and resilient. And overall, the podcast has a really inspiring, uplifting feel. Even if you haven't dealt with loss or illness as a mom, there's something really inspiring about hearing the perspectives of parents who've dealt with really hard things and come through them. And so I felt like listening to their stories gave me more understanding and empathy as well. So check it out. You can listen to Unspoken Stories for free wherever you get your podcasts or by visiting unspokenstories.org. That's unspokenstories.org. Well, Megan, school is about to start for us here in Southern California, and I'm kind of in that nesting mode where I realize everyone needs new everything, including basics like socks and undies. I've talked before on the show about how I have two kids in particular who are really sensitive to the way fabrics feel, and I honestly cannot handle some of the wardrobe battles that happen in the morning when things are uncomfortable, in particular those socks and undies. Everything is so itchy. Why? Why? Why tags? Why? (laughs) 
Anyway, so our sponsor, Lucky and Me, is here to help all of us who deal with this frustration because their kids' clothing is made from fabrics that won't itch or irritate skin. They're always tagless, and they have several 100% organic options. These styles are designed for all-day play with comfy waistbands and super soft and breathable fabrics that retain their fit, stretch, and color even after washing and wearing them many times. And I really love the look of their basics. Undies, leggings, little bike shorts for underdresses, and I'm also loving the camisoles that they've had for the girls. The leggings have quickly become Clara's favorite, and I will say they are holding up very, very well. I love that. Well, Lucky and Me is going to give our listeners a big time discount so you guys can try out their clothes for your kids. Prices are already really reasonable, and they are going to give you 25% off your order when you use the promo code MOMHOUR25 at luckyandme.com. Again, head to luckyandme.com and use the promo code MOMHOUR25 to save 25% off comfy basics for your kids. Okay, so we are going to start with elementary school. I know a lot of you guys have been are in are coming into that place. Um, so Sarah, you have three kids who've now been in elementary school. Yeah. So you've I got do. some tips for us. I have one who made it all the way through and I survived, <laughs> and the other two are still there. So for those who don't know, my kids this school year, in fact, later this week, will start um sixth, fourth, and first grade. Um, and so last school year, they were all three in elementary school. So we'll we'll call me an expert, I guess, or at least having it in recent memory. So um My first tip, which is a practical one, is a five-word phrase that I want all of you guys to memorize because it is very useful. And the five-word phrase when talking to your kids about anything school-related is, tell me more about that. And... This works for so many things. It is a re- And you can keep saying it. No, I was I'm so glad you said that. That is like I almost wanted to do like a role play where Megan, yeah. you you like say something that happened at school. Like the teacher doesn't like me. Tell me more about that. Well, this and this well, and this. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more about that. And okay, you, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's what I was gonna say. You can keep saying it. And they may want to talk a lot. They may not, and they may run out of things to say, but the things you will hear when you say, huh, tell me more about that huh, tell me more about that. That's where the stuff starts to come out. Um, And we've actually done episodes and taken listener questions about when kids come home and talk about the teacher being mean or or friend troubles at school. And so I will link up a few other places where we've talked about that in detail. But I think tell me more about that can work not just for when kids are coming home with, you know, worries or or anxiety, but also with the good stuff. I think uh, we want to, we want to jump in and have so much to say and ask so many questions. Um, and a lot of kids will shut down when you do. So tell me more about that is just an invitation and they, they may or may not take that invitation to say more, but it's a very neutral, I think is what I'm trying to get at. It's not, it's not anything, but, Oh, I have more time for you to tell me more about that. And if you just internalize that phrase, it can be used for so many, so many things. And I think for me, because I I can get, you know, I can jump to conclusions and things like that. It just is like, it diffuses. It's like my job here is not to jump to a conclusion. It's just to provide space. So that is for kids of all ages and anything that might, you know, come home from school in terms of what they're telling you, what they're worried about. Um, And, you know, eventually you will land on other things you might need to say, but when in doubt, tell me more about that. I love that. It's so genius because we all know that no kid, you're not going to get what you want out of a kid if you say, how is school today? Like we all know that, but it's so easy to find yourself falling into those stale old ways of starting a conversation. So with this, you can just wait for them to say something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you ask them to tell you more about that. And then the other, um, the things that we talked about with like kids saying something, you can never take the first thing they say at face value <laughs> ever because they will tell you oh, the teacher, you know, threw a bunch of kids in a closet today. Huh, now, before you, you know, jump to conclusions and go call the principal, tell me more about that. It might be like, well, we actually all went into this giant closet and like read a story. And oh, actually, it wasn't a giant closet. It was the book room. Like, you know what I mean? Yes. Like when you say, tell me more about that, you just, you get the information you need instead of actually listening to what your kindergartner just told mm-hmm. you, which probably is not completely accurate. Absolutely. I yep. love it. Okay. So that's my, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that phrase works in middle and high school, but we'll have to come to that later. Cause I'm guessing kids get smart and maybe don't want to tell you more about anything. Um, it does, but you, sometimes you have to phrase it differently. Uh-huh. Like you have to, yeah, it, but it does sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So, all right. What else you got for us? 
Okay, so my next tip, and this is in particular if you are starting a brand new kinder, but I actually think uh, there's there, different grades can be a big transition year, or you might move schools. I moved schools one year when my kids were in first and third. So anytime it's a, it's a really unfamiliar transition, think of the first six weeks of school like you would with the first six weeks after having a new baby. So most of you listening have gone through that, having a new baby at least once or twice. So you kind of know... Um, you don't put a lot on your schedule. You don't know what you're going to be capable of when you have a new baby. Even the first time you clear your schedule, you're not working. You're, um, it's like a, like a bubble, a bubble of time where Mm -hmm. you know that you'll get back to real life and real routines and exercise and all that. But for this next six weeks, you don't really know what life is going to look like. Now I'm not saying so extreme with school that you will actually have to clear your calendar for six weeks. But if you think of it as this transition bubble, especially for new kinders, um, thinking about keeping the calendar fairly light. Um, I actually am the most extreme. I had all my kinders have no extracurricular activities at all for the entire first semester of kindergarten, just because my kids had had tough kinder transition years and just having a soccer practice or one more thing to think about was just more than they could handle. You don't have to do that approach, but I do think that six weeks is a, is a, a length of time that in my experience, kinders need every bit of that to where it starts to feel normal. Um, and mm-hmm. the other thing about a six week bubble is adjusting expectations on, on, of yourself and of your kid and of things starting to like click. I feel like we get so excited about the first day of school and we meet the teacher and we have all the supplies. And then I've had this feeling where I'm like, Oh wait, it's the second day of school tomorrow. Like we have to do this again and again. And then you get to your first weekend and then you have the first Monday morning and sometimes everything's been going great. And now you've had a weekend off and now nobody wants to go to school. So you have to allow for, I think around a month to six weeks before you can apply judgment to anything, you know, whether Mm -hmm. this is a great teacher fit or whether, you know, your kid is doing thriving or not, they may thrive for a week and then regress. So I just feel like six weeks is this window of lowered expectations and if possible, a reduced schedule, if that's possible. Yeah. And I would also add to that, that, you know, depending where you live and what your kids are into, sometimes it's not possible. Say like, say that your kids play fall baseball or something like that. And there's no way out of it. And it's a particularly intense period. And Mm -hmm. I've been there. So then I would just ease up in other areas. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe we just rely more on meal plan, um, like subscription meal plans or, uh, eating out more often, or we keep our weekends really open or Mm -hmm. something like that. Like, I think there's ways to work around that if you can't go a scorched earth. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, with like extracurriculars and stuff. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, and I think it, it's whatever applies to you. Um, I also think that in terms of academics and getting to know your teacher, last year we did a whole episode called how to be the parent that schools and teachers love or something. And I think we had a conversation where we talked about waiting other than mission critical emails to the teacher, um, waiting around a month or six weeks, or at least until after back to school night to bring up the thing that isn't mission critical. Of course, if you, Mm. if there's something that the teacher needs to know, of course, that line of communication needs to happen. But I think there's a lot that can wait a little bit, um, giving the teacher time to get to know your kid, getting, giving your kid time to really settle in. There is so much, it's so new. And every classroom, if you've ever like, I don't know, you hang out with a lot of teachers, like the, that six week period is they are assessing the kids. They are getting their Mm -hmm. schedule down there. There's so much that happens that it's almost premature to do much about anything, you know, except that maybe the most, you know, the things that just are super, super important to address right away. So, well, everyone's on a learning curve, right? Like you're Mm -hmm. learning how to be the mom to that kid in that class. The Mm -hmm. teacher's learning how to teach that particular classroom. And the kids learning how to be a student in that class. Like everyone is learning all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And six weeks has felt just like after that, we feel like we're, we're into it. You're kind of in it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, what else you got for us? Okay. So this next one is, I guess, maybe an expansion because we're still talking about expectations and timing. But um, I was doing some math this morning when I was thinking about this and I will be an elementary school parent for, I think, think, oh, I already lost the math. It's like 13 years, I think for me in, um, continuously. Um, you were one for like 
18 or something like that because of the spread of your yeah. kids. Mine's less than yeah. 13. I was doing, and I know my mom was an elementary school parent at the same school for like 13 or 14 years. So depending on how many kids and the spread of your kids, your minimum going to probably spend six years at this school, right? And then if you have multiple kids, it gets longer than that. So this is a marathon and not a sprint. And if you are an eager new elementary school parent, you will have lots of opportunities to get involved, to volunteer, to make a good impression, to see your kid in their classroom environment, to go to parties. And of course, like it's all really fun and you get to do what you want to do. But I think it never hurts to be reminded that you, this, you have a lot of time. So when my first was in kindergarten, I had a six month old, six, seven month old and a preschooler. So I was, I was still in that first year of having three kids. Um, and I did very little. And I just remember kind of giving myself a pep talk of like, I can't do it this year, but like in five years, I will be the one who's able to step up more. And so if you are someone who likes to do all the things and say, yes, um, just a gentle reminder that you, you will have many phases of life as an elementary school mom, and you can kind of go in and out of your involvement. And I also think it's good for um, kids to see that that waxes and wanes over time. And if kids' expectations are that you're the room parent every year, it's, it's yeah. a little harder to keep up than if you're not the room parent for the first five years. And then surprise, you've got a little more bandwidth and you get to do something fun like that. So um, yeah, so just just remember it's a marathon and it all doesn't have to happen. You're not You're not getting judged on your school parent report card for this first semester of the first year not going on your permanent record and you'll get better at it too. Like you'd be get you, you figure out workarounds and stuff mm -hmm. and like how to make systems that work for you. So like you won't feel as clueless as you do the first year. There is nothing. The year. I, I felt so clueless as a new school parent. I think more so than like going all the way back to like the first day of junior high. Like it's a very, yeah. it's such a new system and elementary schools that are on the bigger side are, you know, they're like bureaucracies. You like mm -hmm. there's, and it does seem like everyone knows each other and it seems like everyone knows how things work and it is yep. very intimidating. So I, yeah, go easy on yourself and don't, don't have that expectation that you've got to figure it all out the first year and, and your kid, I mean, I think the most important thing is to be there for your kid, but that could be at the kitchen counter after school saying, tell me yeah. more about that. It doesn't have to be <laughs> a physical presence at school for all the things. So. Yep. Yep. All right. So I'm sure you being a very routine <laughs> and organizationally oriented person, <laughs> I'm sure you've got some ideas about like how your home life, um, specifically maybe when the kids are getting home can make the, just the school, the experience of being a school parent better. Yeah. And I think I really amped up my <laughs> attention in this area, probably when my last kid was in preschool and everybody had some sort of schooling. But um, I guess what I'll say about after school routines is it seems like in my house, they, they need to really be, I need to stick to them and decide what they are and stick to them because kids are tired after school. So by after school routines in my house, I mean where they hang up their backpacks, take off their shoes, come inside, empty their lunch boxes, wash their hands, sit down, have a snack. Like that's the, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It might look different in, in your house or anybody else's house, but, um, kids are tired. They have been going through like school routines and there's a lot of this same kind of stuff at school line up here, put your things away here. And I almost feel like it helps to harness that same, <laughs> like teachers know you have to be really structured about that kind of stuff. If you're ever going to get to the fun stuff and the learning. And so I kind of see after school as a continuation of that. Like they need to know where things go, what to do. And anytime I've let it slide, meaning mom, I'm so tired. Can I just yeah. like lay down on the couch? And then I promise I'll do my lunch later it's not, it doesn't work well. You and pay for it later you do. because they don't. They <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah, exactly. And so, well, I think it's one of the routines that I'm least flexible about and most, and it's not, my kids don't have to do a lot, but it's the very, it looks the very same every single day. And I, I really do make them stick to it, whether they're tired or not, whether it's hot or not. And, and then we sit around and they have a snack and it's a really pleasant time of day. So I, I don't think it's like one set routine that has to happen, but, um, remember that those routines serve kids. They don't, they're not to be mean or rigid with kids. They're so that they then can just let go and relax. Mm -hmm. Um, and also so that you're not emptying out stinky lunch boxes at nine o'clock at night, because no one should have to do that starting or in kindergarten. So that you're you're not so that you're not like a grump 
at 8 30 yeah. because you thought you were putting the kids to bed and it turns out one of them has something they didn't get done. Right. I've been that, that grumpy <laughs> mom before. Yeah. Um, I, one thing I do is when the kids, if they forget to bring their lunch in and empty out the bento box and put it in the dishwasher and then put the lunch box away, then when I go to make lunches in the morning, I don't have what I need and they have to pack their own lunch. So that mm. has worked pretty well. Or I might even make a sandwich or something. I, I will do the food prep, but I'm not going to assemble it. So they'll come downstairs right. to breakfast and there's just like a few things out on the counter. And I'm like, well, you got to go finish your job from yesterday and then pack your lunch. And yep. it, it, I mean, it, it works. Um, so yeah, think about, think about what would make your household feel functional after school and then stick to it. Don't let them, stick don't let it. them get, you know get loose with those routines. So, wow. Well, this is great. I think that people will be going into their kids elementary experience a little more prepared. Well, thank you. I have thoughts to share. Okay. Well, we are going to take a quick break and then I am all, all over you. I need all of the info (laughs) about starting middle school. Megan, we talk all the time on this show about how enjoying motherhood often comes down to making choices about how we spend our time. And our sponsor, Care.com, totally gets it. And when it comes to finding and managing family care, they make it really simple so you can spend your time doing the things you really want to do. Their digital marketplace is the largest in the world with more than 8.6 million caregivers in 16 countries. So even in a small town or remote location, you're likely to find the housekeeper, dog walker, senior caregiver, tutor, errand runner, or nanny that you're looking for. Yeah. So even in Mayberry, where we joke that I live, um, (laughs) no, I'm in a really small town and I've been really impressed that I've been able to line up part-time nannies several times. And I've had a lot of selection, a lot of people to choose from when I do a search. That's so great. We both know that having quality care lined up just makes family life and working mom life so much simpler. Care.com can even help with household payroll and nanny taxes through Care.com home pay. So whether you're looking for full-time or part-time help, getting started is easy. You're going to sign up as a basic member. And from there, you can post a job. You can view in-depth caregiver profiles. Plus, you'll have access to background checks, reviews, and articles with tips from parents and caregivers on all things care-related. Once you upgrade to premium membership, which we're going to save you 30% on, you can reach out to potential caregivers and actually schedule interviews and even book and pay for the care online or through their app. So to save 30% on a care.com premium membership, visit care.com slash mom hour or enter promo code mom hour when you subscribe. Again, it's care.com slash mom hour or enter the promo code mom hour to save 30% off a care.com premium membership. We are really excited to welcome back our sponsor, Love Every, that's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y, all one word with the Middle East shared. Love Every is an award-winning children's playtime company, and their products are designed by child development experts to be exactly what kids need at each stage of development. I actually gave one of their newborn play kits to some expecting friends of mine a couple months ago, and I was so impressed by not only the quality, but how many different activities were in the play kit and how well tailored it was to a really itty bitty baby. That's just not easy to do. But these kits are beautiful to look at and they're beautiful to unbox as well, which means they make a great baby shower or a new baby gift. Or in my case, birthday gift for a two-year-old because Love Every sent over the play kit that's geared toward 22 to 24 month olds. And I got to unbox it with my niece, which was maybe the highlight of my entire summer. (laughs) I can't say enough great things about the way these toys are designed. I mean, I've had three toddlers myself. I kind of know those developmental stages they go through. You know, there's the stacking phase and the phase where they want to fill, put stuff in baskets and take it out. And then how obsessed they get with looking at books that have silly pictures. I mean, I've been through all that, but Love Every turned these natural stages into genuinely fun things to do, both for the babies and grownups. So my niece was particularly obsessed with the board books in the box. They featured these really clear photos of toddlers kind of going through their day and experiencing real emotions, including one book about visiting the doctor and getting a shot. And she wanted to look at it and talk about it over and over again, which to me tells me it was right on point for what she's going through developmentally. It was really cute. Yeah, it's really impressive. The play kit started zero to 12 weeks. And they continue all the way up to 24 months. So they can really take your child from basic visual and sensory experiences to those early stages of vocabulary, imagination, and problem solving. And we've got a great deal for you. Right now, Love Every is offering our listeners $15 off new Play Kit subscriptions. This offer is only available for a limited time and only when you visit loveevery.com slash mom and use our code mom at checkout. That's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y dot com slash mom to check out all the incredible play kits Love Every offers, and you're going to save $15 off your subscription with our special code MOM. All right, Megan, before you start giving me all the middle school advice, um, I have to say that our school-related episodes are some of my favorite that we've done on the podcast, Mm -hmm. and this is our fifth 
back to school season, I guess. So um, on our website at themomhour.com, we, you can search by category and I will link up all school related episodes. We have ones about, you know, parent teacher communications. We have interviews about getting ready for kindergarten. We have like, there, we have a lot of really, really great content about starting school. Um, so if you are in this space and just want to deep dive into all of this, we've got a lot more for you on the website. So I will link that up in the show notes for this episode. Um, but also anytime you head to the momhour.com and just type in school or back to school, you should get what you need. Okay. So I have a entering middle schooler for the first time mm-hmm. and you have one middle schooler and three who've made it all the way through, right? Does that um, three who've made it all the way through middle school. Yep. So Will's going into 10th grade. Um, the oldest two are graduated high school. And then Owen is moving into seventh grade. So he's right in the middle. He's right in the middle. Um, and I will say most of the stuff that I'm talking about also kind of applies to the beginning of high school. I feel like the kids cycle through and middle and high school can look, they're very different, but there's a lot of similarities about what it feels like at the very beginning Yeah. of both of those experiences. So if your kids are going into high school, you'll find a lot. You know, yeah. Yeah. And I did school, kind of lump yeah. those together. Wait, Owen's going into eighth grade, isn't he? Oh gosh. He's going into eighth grade. That's did what I you just meant. say my kid's going into seventh grade. That's totally what I meant. <laughs> did I did tell you that I am not in school mode yet. Right. And the funny thing about me is I've never been one of those to think of my kid as like a rising anything. I know. Remember like, we, we didn't mind, even know that was a thing rising. Well, of- and in my mind, Clara is a fourth grader until the day she starts fifth grade. Like mm. I have not, I, in my head has not switched. So Owen is the seventh grader because he hasn't started eighth grade yet. Like in my mind, it's just, I know it's a funny little thing that, um, a way that we culturally talk about our kids yeah. changing grades. But in my mind, I've never felt like my kids have actually moved on. Until, until they, they until down. they do. I do. Yeah. I, I may be somewhere in the middle. I do kind of find it weird when the last day of school, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you're in sixth grade now. It's like, whoa, whoa, yep. whoa. No, you're not. Right. But Give I do minutes, at some point minutes. over the summer, I start to kind of make the transition and you just aren't yep. there yet. That's okay. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> no, nope, August brain. Okay. So what <laughs> wisdom do you have for me? What's your first tip or truth? Okay. Well, first of all, that mine are going to really focus both like basically equally on academics and social stuff, okay. because in middle school in particular, um, it's, it's m- as much about social development as it is about academics and, but it's happening at like a high stakes time for both. Mm-hmm. Like it's high stakes academically because kids are learning in a completely new way. They have way more teachers, but socially they're more probably awkward than they've ever been. And they're trying to figure out this completely new system. So there's like this kind of yin and yin and yang. So mm-hmm. The first thing I'll say is like their friendships are going to change. So if you're used to your um, fifth grader, say, having finally gotten solid with this group of kids and those are their their buddies or his buddies, and that's just the way it's always been, something is going to change. Now, it might not happen in sixth grade. It might actually be like more toward the middle. I found with my kids that they have a big shift in their friendships around seventh grade and then again around 10th grade. And it might not mean that their core group goes away, but they're going to start kind of flirting with bringing new kids in and some kids are going to go out. And it's really hard to resist the urge to worry about that or get really involved. But I have found for the most part, my kids take it in stride. Like they don't, they're not emotional about it. Mm -hmm. It's just the way things are. The kids are changing interest the kids um like the minute I start to get all bent out of shape like oh I haven't seen you hang out with so-and-so anymore gosh what's up with that did you have a falling out and one of my kids will say like no like he plays soccer now so I just Mm. never see him (laughs) it's not a big deal or or we didn't end up in any classes together like kids of this age are very it's like it's circumstantial their friendships tend to be very circumstantial and if you don't end up in a homeroom or any classes with one kid, you might not talk to that kid at all that year. If you're not in their lunch, they might fall off your radar. That doesn't mean they won't end up back on the radar. And it can be a little awkward with parents. I think if the parents are friends, Mm. I think there can be some awkwardness around the fact that kids totally aren't hanging out anymore. But for the most part, unless my kids come to me and want to talk about a friendship that's falling apart, it's just the natural ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. And it's just, just let it happen. Cause you'd never know who like, 
Think about your middle school experience. Did you end up with the exact same best friends at the end of it as at the beginning? Probably not. And then you went into high school and things changed again. It, it just, it happens. Yeah, actually, I was thinking about my own as you were talking and I had big changes in friends. It wasn't even, and I don't actually remember any strife about it. It just happened. Yeah, like you said, it happens. but I can see how from the outside as a parent and there weren't really big fallings out. I think they were mm-hmm. gradual enough that it wasn't like I never, I, I never had a point where I had zero friends and had to go shopping right. for a new one. It just, it was an ebb and flow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, that's a good okay, one. Okay. So the, and along those same lines, like I have found that kids of this age are often really good at focusing either on academics or on social stuff, but rarely is a kid, especially (laughs) going through all this, good at both. I mean, think about it. Like, if you right now were trying to absorb the amount of information that a sixth grade student, say, is absorbing, and you were trying to make a bunch of new friends in classes you've never been in before, and you had zits and boobs (laughs) all of a sudden... (laughs) Like, really, there's only so many places that you can put your attention, yeah. right? So I think that just like you were saying with the six-week kind of phase of letting, like, that newborn phase, mm-hmm. that's kind of, again, like, they're gonna, there's going to be academic ups and downs. There's going to be social ups and downs as they're figuring it out. It's normal, and it's not linear. I think elementary school can sometimes start to feel a little linear because of the nature of how progressive it is over time mm-hmm. and how from year to year they just things change a little bit, but not hugely, right? They add in that like two, three, four, five. It is, I mean, having just gone through it, it's pretty same, same. Like, yeah, it's like this year they develop a few more skills in that area and, and their class might change a little bit in in its constitution, but they're probably going to have some of the same kids from last year. And it's, it's kind of like the skills build and the academics build and it feels expected. Like the curve feels or the, the angle or whatever you want to say the slant. It feels like you're on this sort of steady march up, but then you get into middle school and it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, um, I always found that for my kids, seventh grade was way harder than sixth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's just the school my kids are in. I don't know if that is based on kind of the academics and how they work out, but my kids will sail through sixth and then hit seventh. And then they're just bummed out and exhausted all the time. And so it's not, it's going to be a little more up and down than maybe what you're used to. It reminds me of when you have a baby and a toddler and just like you were saying, it's not, not, they're not going to excel at both. Like you have babies and toddlers who are super physical and working on Mm -hmm. all their gross motor skills and can run and jump and climb stairs. Or you have babies like mine who could speak in full sentences, but didn't walk because they just were working on a different set of skills. So I think, yeah, that helps to kind of frame it that way. It will all all of those acquired skills will at some point mature, but they're not going to mature at the same time or linearly. I like it. Yeah. And at that time, I mean, your, your kid is going to be learning a lot about, you know, I've talked before about this, like how to be funny with other kids. They're going to fail at that. Like yeah. how, to, how to figure out their peck, their place in the pecking order. And there is a pecking order and, and everyone hates that that's a thing, but it, it is. And kids can get comfortable with where they kind of land in the mix. But I think it takes a lot of understanding and maybe a little less pressure from us than we might want to play on. Super helpful. Yeah. Okay. What else? All right. So um, your kids' relationships with their teachers are going to change and your relationships with your kids' teachers are going to change. This was a big shocker for me going from elementary school with my oldest into sixth grade and realizing that my, my son's teachers didn't know his name for like at the first conference, they, they had to look him up in a book. They didn't know who he was because instead of having 30 kids, these teachers have six classes Mm -hmm. of 30 kids. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot more kids that they have to organize and get to know. They have less time with each child. Um, and conferences go from being like this 15 minute, like love fest on your kid and talking really intently and deeply about their, their skills and their personalities to like these four or five minute, I'm going to look in the grade book and tell you what your kid is doing and not doing. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll remember a specific, but probably not. And I, I found that very disappointing and disorienting. Like Mm -hmm. I remember going, coming out of my son's sixth grade, um, 
conference thinking, but he didn't say anything about Jacob. Yeah. Like what? no one said anything nice about him. I'm yeah. used to everyone saying nice things. And yeah. it was just all, you know, just the facts. Like, here's what he's missing and here's how he's doing on tests. And I remember coming out, like almost being insulted by that mm-hmm. and then getting used to that. That's just like, these teachers have so much going on right now. There's no possible way they can sit here and share anecdotes about now they might some are really good at it and some will have something personal to say but it's just the nature of the conference Mm -hmm. itself completely changes um now you're we talked about this a little bit recently in an episode we were talking about um getting along with teachers and i was saying you know when your kid has one teacher it's pretty easy to kind of figure out what their style is and sort of mold the way you do things to fit Mm -hmm. to be that good mom like that good teacher parent or whatever it is impossible when they have six or seven teachers because they all have a different teaching style. You can't keep up with it. You and your child cannot please every single teacher. Right. So just be yourself, like know what's important to you, stick to your family's values, support your kid as best as possible. But also remember that that class or that teacher represents like one hour mm-hmm. in a six or seven hour school day. And in a semester probably will be over and your kid will have moved on to a completely mm-hmm. different class. So if there's one it just isn't like that magic isn't there or like the kids just really not having a great time. By the time you let them ease in that semester is probably going to be half over and they've got five other classes mm-hmm. that are, I don't know, diluting it, that experience. It doesn't, it doesn't take up, it doesn't need to take up as much mental energy as, a, as the teacher that your child is with all day long. And it's a great, it's a great learning opportunity for kids you don't even have to tell them that they're learning something they will be learning actually I kind of have fond memories of hating a few of my teachers it was like you got it's like trying a bunch of new foods if you only eat your favorite foods you're going to be happy but if you try a bunch of crazy new foods you're going to hate some but you're going to have more to talk about and I I kind of have like really um wonderful junior high memories of you know whispering with my friends about the teachers I thought were so dumb and then also loving a few teachers so that richness of the novelty experience like you talk about sometimes with your personality it could be a really great thing I think for switching yeah. around and I like and it does like create that, that common bond you know in my in my house now these kids have all gone through the same teachers and mm-hmm. so Jacob still talks about teachers from his middle school years and now Owen's got something to say and Will's got something to say and Owen had a teacher this year who he really didn't last year who he really didn't like and then at one point he had to stay after to like clean the chalkboard or uh-huh. something. I don't he was in trouble of some sort he didn't turn something in on time and she asked him about his brothers <laughs> like in a in kind of a positive way like okay. oh I remember your brother William he was really cool and then after that that teacher was like on his good side for the rest of the year and it all that that's all it took but then I asked him I said oh what about you know Mrs. So-and-so I thought you really liked her he's like you know what afterwards I looked back and I realized no nope, she was really the worst but I just like I decided I liked her at the end of the school like he was so up and down about it yeah. and it didn't He didn't really care. It's not like it was hurting his feelings. Um, But then they have other teachers that they all rave about. And one day, Owen was like kind of, it was a month into the summer. And Owen just gets this far away look on his face and goes, I wonder what Mr. Foster is doing right now. Oh my gosh, that's that's the cutest. But this was the teacher that everyone just loved. Like he was just beloved by all of my kids. So it became this thing that they all talk about. So there is some bonding that goes totally. on. Totally. Well, I have to share something that happened when I was visiting you. Um, your best friend is your sister-in-law, Jenna, and she is a yes. middle school science teacher. And yep. I've met her several times and, you know, gotten to know her a little bit, but we went around, remember we went to have a drink at one place and we went throughout the time, it was your 40th birthday. So we were, That's we right. were at yep. several establishments and everywhere she went were former students and she yes. did know all of their names. They yep. now I obviously Jenna's probably an amazing teacher and one of the special ones, but it's so it's so interesting that you're right. That first conference, they haven't gotten to know your kid yet. But give right. it time and like you said, those bonds will form. The family, you know, one kid having that teacher and then the next kid. And if you're in a community like that, then over time these are still people who are, you know, will remember your kid. I thought that was so sweet how everywhere she went, kids said hi to her, but she knew most of them. I'm like, how do you she know? Didn't know? Yeah, and there she, were like she had 20s, a chance. Some of them. Yeah. 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 She had a chance to get to know them and not just like, you know, she had them and so they were new to her, but then when they've moved on, then she remembers their names. 
and they move on. And sometimes she can't remember their last name or sometimes she's loses the, um, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, I know who that kid is, but I can't play. That's them. like thousands. That does that's thousands. thousands of kids. Yeah. So yes, that will change. And she is, uh, I think special, but I think eventually, like, it won't be the way it is during the first month. The first month, like you said, everyone, it's the learning curve. Everyone's just getting it. Um, that relationship will grow. And then it stays. It's really, it's quite fun to I watch, think actually. It's really, with her. I'm really glad you shared that about the first conference with Jacob. I, I'm remembering a couple, few years ago, we talked about starting preschool and how every mm. everyone thinks their kid's a special snowflake. And you want to have that conversation at the preschool door where you're like, how did yep. he eat? I mean, did he eat all of his lunch? And like, it can feel like the teacher is like, your kid is just like, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But that's a necessary, it's a necessary yeah. distancing of you, your, t- the teacher isn't supposed to think your kid hung the moon. Like that's a, right. it's an, that's a good thing really, but it can yeah. be shocking whether it happens in preschool. And I'm so glad you shared that it kind of happened again in middle school. Like, wait, why yeah. don't you know, you know, how great why my kid is? Why don't you know everything about my kid? <laughs> yes. All It'll right. come, they'll get to know them better, but it's not going to happen in the first month probably. Yeah. Okay. That's good to um, know. What else we this got? Isn't, this isn't really a tip. It's just a, an observation that like kindergarten, like the first day of preschool or kindergarten, um, your new middle schooler will be exhausted. Okay. So I would, especially if they, if their sh- um, schedule shifts at all, mm-hmm. like if they suddenly have to get up earlier, a lot of middle schools have to get up earlier than elementary, which is completely backward for child development and but all that, but that's yeah. still the way it often goes. Um, and I just remember finding Owen uh, last year and especially the year before, like sleeping in random places all <laughs> over the house. Like I'd walk in the living room and like, why is there a lump on the sofa under that blanket? And it was, <laughs> Owen would come flop face first. He would stick his face in the corner of the sofa and just pass out for like 45 <laughs> minutes after school. And uh, William does it too. Still, he just goes in his bedroom. Owen will fall asleep anywhere, but it, they, they do need some time. Um, their little brains. I mean, their yeah. big growing brains, I should say are exhausted. They're learning a lot. And it's not just academic learning that's happening. It's just all of it. Yes. So, well, I remember like, taking naps after school in high school. I was, I was yeah. staying up too late and had to get up early and I would, it was, they weren't accidental naps. I would come home and like put myself down for a nap before I went to dance yeah. and I would set an alarm. It was just, I napped almost every day in high school. Well, think about what's going on in their bodies. I yeah. mean, yeah. Like you're, there's adolescence now mm-hmm. too. So all this is happening. I, I think about middle school and what's expected of middle school kids. It's really unfair for all the things that are happening to their bodies. Like mm-hmm. just at the time, wouldn't it be nice to be able to coast a little bit Yeah, and just to figure out um, who you are and where you fit now, suddenly school changes and like everything is different all at once. So it's a very awkward time. And I think it's a time that can be difficult to really choose, like to really, um, hone in on super solid memories. Like my memories of middle school are much and junior high for me are much more scattered and unreliable than my memories from elementary school or high school. Okay. And I just think it's cause there's just so much going on. Yeah. Your brain can't process it all. Yeah. It's just too much. And I'll remember something sometimes and be convinced it happened in seventh grade. And then when I go back and really like kind of line up the dates, I'm like, Oh no, that was like, I was younger or older mm-hmm. or it didn't happen the way I thought. And my memory is pretty reliable for elementary school and high school, but middle school is just. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it, 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 like the, hearing you talk about it, just, I feel like I hear a lot of compassion. It's not that, yeah. you know, it's not that they get a free pass for everything, but that there is just have, have compassion. Right. Yes. Have compassion. And remember too, that in a lot of ways, middle school is practice for high school. Mm-hmm. So a lot of, if they do see an academic slump, it might affect them in some ways because that might mean they have a harder time getting into a class that they really would like to get into in their freshman year, which can throw things off. But I feel like parents tend to give all that a lot of, a lot of our energy and and a lot of anxiety around that, um, that potentially happening. And teachers aren't out to get your kid. Like, it's not like they're like looking at your seventh grader going, Oh, if he doesn't get his act together, I'm not putting him in algebra one, which means he's never going to get into geometry and, you know, in freshman year, and then he's never going to make it to trig or calculus or whatever there is kind of that trajectory depending on the setup in your state and everything like that. Um, but like teachers are looking not just at what your kid is doing today, but they're like how able they'll be to handle what Mm -hmm. they put them into tomorrow. So it's not a punishment if your kid isn't doing as well academically in a certain class in seventh grade and doesn't wind up in the class they want to be in an eighth grade. It's not like a teacher decided to hold that against them. Like, 
they're there to help them get in the right place in high school so that they're successful in high school. It's not, it, I think sometimes we can have this sort of, I don't know, like we're at war or like we're having to like shove our kids through the system and make sure that they get everything they can out of it. And the teachers are also there to assess mm -hmm. fairly um, based on what they see. And so if they just don't think it's a good fit, they're probably not going to make that recommendation. And that's probably a good thing. Right. I've heard somebody say it. Maybe it was Jess Leahy, who you've interviewed and we've talked a lot, but, and she's a middle school teacher, but uh, somebody said that middle school is where you learn to be a student. So yeah. like the learning is obviously happening, the subject learning, but also if we don't allow those actual learning, how to study, how yeah. to take tests, how to, which you really, like you were, when you were just talking about that, you really couldn't do that as well in a class that you were just completely underwater in, right? It would take, right. because you just would be so lost. You wouldn't be also acquiring the organizational skills and the study yeah. skills because you'd be, yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. And, and, on, and on the same token, there's going to be some failing, like there's mm -hmm. going to be some trial and error and kids not getting it right. Kids thinking they can skirt the system, like a seventh grader thinking they can get away with not making the notes on the, the index cards and still passing the test. Mm -hmm. And then they learn the hard way that they can. And mm -hmm. it's middle school is the time when parents have to start stepping back and allowing and still keeping an eye, but allowing kids to take ownership of that. And that can be really hard. Yeah. So yeah. Good luck. <laughs> I feel like in the other, I feel like in the other class um, episodes where we've talked about school, that's been a recurring theme too. Yeah. Like the, how, how to let kids, gradually take that ownership yes. and not to feel like you're letting them down or just checked out, but also not to be hand like white knuckle hand holding yeah. so hard that they don't learn for themselves. No, it's so. just, it's just hard. I hear in your voice that you have a little anxiety about this. Just, Sarah, so. just, just a little bit. Just a titch. <laughs> um, well, you have one more right. tip for me, don't you? I got one more tip and this is kind of a quickie, but it, I think with this, this isn't really about the whole school year, but I, if this can in any way, um, bring a sense of calm to the first day with elementary school, depending on how your school set up. A lot of times those school supply lists go out early. And a lot of times that's because the supplies are kind of communal. I don't know how it is in your school, but in ours, a lot of the supplies they want you to have in on day one or sometimes beforehand, like you're supposed to bring them in at the ice cream social or back to school night or whatever, um, because those are going to be shared. What I have found, and this isn't always the case, but what I have found with my middle and high school kids is that often they don't get complete supply lists until after they've started. So like on the first day, they might get a syllabus that tells you kind of what they're going to need. And you don't always know that going in. Just be aware that you've got a little time and you probably just won't know everything before day one. And so that buys you time. Like send them in with a notebook and some pens and pencils and you'll probably be able to buy yourself a little time for the rest. Yeah. And, and it's also just going back to the you know, kids starting to advocate for themselves and stuff. It's, it's good for the kids to get in there and be like, Oh, I really do need a five tab divider, right. you know, so that yeah. they, they know that school supplies aren't just handed to them on the first day. Yeah, exactly. And, and sometimes teachers at the middle school level are very flexible about what they'll let kids use. Like some will say, Hey, you can have a five subject notebook and you can just use one of the subjects in that notebook for this class. Some of them want them to have a separate notebook, you know, sometimes like the kind of calculator you might buy could could be different than what you think. So don't freak out about having to be completely prepared. What I'm hearing is there may even be some advantages to being unprepared. I think there are many advantages to being unprepared. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to stick with that. That is my story and I'm sticking to it. I will take as much of that truth as I can possibly <laughs> hold in my soul, which is difficult. I like to call it, I like to think of it as delaying preparation. Yeah. Well, You're I'm all about unprepared. You're just doing it at the appropriate time. So as much as I like to be prepared ahead of time and I love to plan, I also don't like waste. We know that about me and I like efficiency. So there are times where I can totally see like there, you know, I'm going to save money, save time and, you know, have all the right stuff if I actually just wait till after the first day. So I can, I yeah. can get on, I can get them on board there. Yeah. And I've even been, I've even had the experience where my kids schedule changes. Oh yes. I can because see that. Because the teacher moves or something like that. So the last thing you want to do is buy supplies for one teacher and then find out that you need to buy different supplies for another. So right. just don't do anything. Yeah.
Yes, I like it. I like it. The preparation strategy of not preparing. Exactly. Um, okay. Well, that was super helpful for me. Selfishly, Good. it was all about was all about me today. I get it now. Why this episode had to happen. Okay. But hopefully, <laughs> those of you out there with older kids starting middle and high school, and then many of you with elementary schoolers found this helpful. Um, like I said, we have a ton of back to school episodes on all these kind of topics, where it's more of a deep dive into any number of the things we mentioned today. So all of those will be at themomhour.com. This is episode 221. And Megan, thanks for the advice. Of course. Thank you. 